can get up to next. Thank you very much for remembering the recording. Um, if you look at line 62, we have a code of conduct, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and really, it's just remember to be kind and inclusive of everybody that's here today. Um, if you do experience um, or witness any unacceptable behaviour, then please do report it to the organisers. So we've got uh, Emmy and um, Yo here at the moment, and there are email addresses in line 63 and 64 for you to do that. Um, also, you'll notice on the top that we've got Otter um, transcript going, so you can see, see the live transcript. That doesn't mean that we're live on YouTube. I used to think we were all the time, but that's not true. Um, it's just that we're recording and you can get the live transcript if you need that. Um, please, we're also having um, some breakout rooms. So um, if you could put in your Zoom name um, at W for um, if you'd like to be in a written reflection based room for the breakout or S if you want to be in a spoken um, discussion breakout room or if you want, but if you don't mind either, you can at both, which I normally do. Um, and I think that's probably all of the introductions. Probably the other thing to say is actually after this week, we're having a two week break. Have I got that right? Nod, Yo or Emmy, everyone, yeah. It's two weeks, so I, I'm now wishing you a lovely break because I know this Friday I'm turning my computer off and it's not gonna get turned on again, hopefully, for those two weeks. <laughs> so I wish you all, I've got all oh, three weeks. Isn't it three week break? Oh, it might be. When do we come back? I don't know. We'll, we'll find out when we come back. Um, it's in January anyway, so I look out for that. OK, um, have I said everything to begin with that I should have said? Yes, I think so. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if we, we've got some amazing guest speakers today, so we probably need to get on with that. Um, so our call today is going to be about um, we're going to be learning about the motivations and practicalities of actually practicing open science. So how do we actually get it done? All the things we've been learning about, um, sharing some knowledge through training, about also about preprints, um, DOIs and citations. I'm really interested in that citation talk because I've been writing my first citation CFF file this morning. So um, I want to know more about that. So yeah, I've actually got some questions already for you, <laughs> Stefan. Um, and then also publishing um, and citing research code um, and open access, someone has just written. So thank you very much for adding that. So our first speaker is the wonderful Patricia, um, and she's going to be talking about um, data management plans and fair data, which is a wonderful topic. So, and I'll leave you just to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you, Emma. Oh, I don't have participant screen sharing. Can someone give me right I so I it. can share my slides? I mean, you have them all uh, in the, uh, I've linked them in the pad already. So you can- I think you should be, oh. should be a go uh, now. Yep, yeah, that looks good. Duh. Here we go. Is that good for everyone? Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, cool. So uh, thank you for the invitation to um, come back and talk a bit about the, the future of I, open science, where, where I see it going, um, the bits that I'm doing to contribute. Um, so my name is Patricia Hatterich. I uh, work at the Digital Curation Center, which is um, a group based at the University of Edinburgh and the University of Glasgow, who are like just working in um, mainly research data management uh, and open science bits. So I believe I was invited, if my slides move, because of these like various affiliations that I have, I'm like as part of my role at the DCC, I'm a product managing a tool called the MP Online, I'm more about that uh, in, in a bit. Um, also, um, a project member in the pro a project called Fair's Fair, which I think um, some of you or you've seen potentially some links and pointers to that uh, in, in the weeks talking about uh, making your data fair and uh, getting um, hints there. I've also been a committee member on uh, an initiative called the Hidden Ref, which just um, looked at yeah, maybe like crediting a few more outputs that the, the usual research papers and especially also the um, 
the roles and the people that um, help make that work. And I think actually the, uh, all the OLS volunteers were submitted um, uh, in that as well. And uh, hopefully someone got a certificate for that. And uh, I mentored in the first uh, round of um, Open Life Sciences in cohort one and two, and I'm happy to be back now um, to for an, for an expert talk about um, um, data management plans and how that uh, they fit with fair data. And uh, um, as that's what I've been mainly focusing on the last two years of my career. Um, so uh, data management plans or data management plan, if you haven't heard of it, or just as a, a little reminder, is basically a document that is usually written up at the start of your um, project and outlines how the data will be created, how it will be documented, um, who can access it, where it will be stored and backed up, and um, uh, whether it, it can be shared and if so where you do it and under which conditions um so it's it's basically just like good good planning at the start of your research project um and should also cover who on in on your project team um has the responsibilities um to to do um individual aspects of that and um it should get updated as you progress your work um, and change any processes. So it's not just a tick box exercise at the start, although um, uh, for in, in reality, it mainly is, especially if like your funder requires, if, if it's for a funded project and the funders require it, then it's mainly a tick box exercise to upload that as part of your grant, let's be honest. But um, it, it should, it, it is, more useful than just ticking that box and um, should also be applied more wider. So DMP Online, the tool um, that I'm basically uh, managing is a web-based tool um, that helps you write a data management plan. Um, and uh, it's uh, free for every user to sign up and use it. Um, and it provides basically templates for different requirements. So various funders, um, European funders have uh, their uh, templates in there that make sure you tick all the boxes that they um, uh, and answer all the questions they want you to address. And um, quite a few institutions, especially in Europe, have picked up um, their own templates um, uh, and have we have we cover those as well. There's also guidance in the tool um, if, the, if it's available. Um, and you can collaborate with um, uh, with folks that you're um, you're working on the project or on the planning. Um, it can basically invite them and co-edit in the tool and then at the end export into a variety of formats. So um, the future of, of data management plans is um, going in, in, the action, uh, in the direction of making them more machine actionable. Um, that goes back to like uh, fair principles of interoperability and just generally making things more machine readable. And um, the, the community and a lot of the people that um, are working on these deep data management plan tools have actually come together and created a, a standard um, that facilitates the automated ex exchange between various systems, which um, we are also uh, implementing in, in uh, DMP Online, the tool we run. And the idea behind it is that, like, this is now the um, on the slide, you, you, you can see um, the, the very data management plan centric view of it. But it basically, um, the idea is that uh, the information you provide in a data management plan can actually automatically be pushed to other systems, um, like a, a repository um, or a, like a code storage system like GitHub or Zenodo or um, any um, updates that you do in those systems um, that are you know, useful to have in your data management plan can be pushed in the, the other direction. Um, and just because there are like, you know, so many documents like ethics documents, um, your data management plan, anything that you then pre start creating to document the data um, 
it's a lot of like potentially the same information in a lot of places and machine actionable data management plans. The idea is um, that um, they, they help so you don't have to type the same thing over and over again. So um, that's the, the future of data management plans. Um, so to say what that, that, that we are working on is basically to just make the whole infrastructure system a little bit smoother and uh, making it um, easier for any researcher to um, exchange or, or information between systems and not having to type everything several times. Um, another thing where I think we're, or I hope we're um, one of the um, parts that is, is shaping um, the models for the future is in our business model. Um, so initially we, we had project funding from um, mainly UK funders to develop the tool. Um, but then when that funding ran out, it's a bit like, how do you keep this sustainable? How do you keep going? And um, we, in 2016, joined forces with colleagues at the California Digital Library in the US who basically ran a similar tool. And we thought we could just, you know, it, it looked similar, it had similar functionalities. So we went through the um, effort and merged um, our code bases together in, in one single open source code base that is available on, on GitHub. Um, but because, you know, open source is nice, but someone still has to pay for your developer. The way uh, we do that is that in 2018, we um, basically introduced subscription um, subscriptions for institutions. They get ad additional features, like they can customize things and like integrate it into their institutional workflows. Um, and uh, yeah, get like basically special functionalities. Um, and um, that way it st still st stays free for every researcher. And we basically make money off um, institutions that want to, to work integrating the system um, in their in institutional setups. And that basically pays for um, um, the work we are like our developers and all the other work we're doing. Um, so in that sense, we, we have like an interesting uh, business model in the sense that it's like all infrastructure run by the University of Edinburgh. So um, uh, that, that means we are kind of um, a charity and we can't make money, which I think is quite nice if you look at the the landscape of open access uh, and open science tools out there and you're never quite sure who owns it and what their actual interests are. Um, so ours is really like paid for by um, the other research institutions that um, um, subscribe and basically give us the money just to actually cover the, the um, um, staff costs that we have to run the tool. And it also means that um, basically all, the only people influencing the way we're going are our users. So the paying community that we invite several times per year to a user group to get their input and priorities. Um, and um, just uh, the, the wider community development uh, in, in terms of pushing the, the open source um, code base in, and including things like the, the machine actionable um, standard and just making sure we're um, keeping uh, in touch with what the community develops and where where um, that you know open open science uh, discussions are going and what roles data management plans play therein and make sure that's reflected in the tool. Um, I'm not sure where I'm for for time, but I have a feeling I probably should speed up a little bit. <laughs> so uh, where do um, does fair data come in there? Um, uh, not very obviously, I would say, like um, data management plans can help plan for um, making your data fair because they basically ask you early to, to think about uh, the steps you would take. And um, in the case of the European Commission, um, their, their template explicitly asks, um, it goes through all the, the, the individual fair principles and asks you to address um, how you see you, the data you create fit in with those. And um, like if we go 
move more towards machine actionable things, then that could also mean that you could automatically um, assess what you put in your data management plan and potentially have like tools that um, go and assess that for um, assess the, the plan that you have out uh, laid out for fairness. Um, and uh, that is a potential scenario that we basically thought through as part of the FAIRS FAIR project, where we looked at um, FAIR assessment of uh, various objects and where in the wider research life cycle um, you could uh, check for fairness of your data sets already. Um, and uh, you can hopefully see here scenario one would be like already like running your data management plan through a fair assessment tool um, and seeing what comes out of that. Um, but that is a, a very theoretical um, scenario at this point, and I'm not aware of any of the um, fair assessment tools that would actually work at that stage. So um, with that, I'm already on the FAIRS FAIR project where I kind of worked the last two years uh, on um, various aspects that can help um, making data more, uh, more fair. Again, I'm like mainly one step removed from the actual researchers um, that are working on, on hands-on things on, on making data fair. So I'm mainly working with uh, the, the infrastructures and services, which is like, um, sometimes a bit slightly less exciting and you feel like you're that one step removed, um, but still important because that's a lot of the like, you know, uh, invisible things that um, where you can easily hide a few good practices that make researchers life so much easier and like basically um, help it, uh, help them make their data fair. Um, so, so some of the um, work um, and that, that goes back to this fair assessment scenarios is um, a few tools uh, um, that help assessing the, the fairness or in uh, the case of fair aware, um, actually just like preparing, uh, like, you know, uh, raising awareness that uh, the data you're um, about to submit or create, how fair that might end up being. Um, so that's one of the tools that we created. and. Um, uh, as part of the uh, the project, and the other tool is um, called Fuji, and that actually um, works on published data sets and data repositories, where you can just um, check how how fair they are assessed um, against like metrics that we developed for for the project, and it's actually rather hard to translate uh, the FAIR principles in, in something that is like a yes, no check. Um, so, well, there's a lot of discussion about like FAIR assessment tools. Um, I would be like slightly careful about what they can actually tell you because it is so hard and there are so many like gray areas that like a machine at the moment um, just can't assess and um, so even like you know if something doesn't score high if you if you put it in a tool like that don't worry too much. Um, some other highlights that uh, um, I wasn't that much uh, um, involved in but mainly like monitored is that we tried to create a library of training material um, that supports training on FAIR. So the project has not run a lot of um, uh, training sessions and the material is now all available, um, ready for you to search, filter, reuse as you see fit. Um, I noticed uh, just before we started the irony of my own presentation, not having a DOI and being out of uh, out and somewhere on the Zenodo yet. So um, what I'm presenting about fair data isn't actually as fair as it could be, but I'll work on that and I'll get that done afterwards. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I think a, a, a useful resource if you're um, uh, looking for pointers to start uh, doing some training on um, fair data. And um, the other bits are just um, things that, that I spend quite a lot of time on that aren't like nicely visible. There are no nice visuals and they, they are not super exciting, but like, um, as I said, I, I, I still think the infrastructure work is, um, is quite important. Um, so uh, I spent like the last two years working on a um, uh, recommendations and a framework for, for services that work 
on data uh, and with data um, and how they can support uh, fairness and the other um, bigger piece of work is uh, was with um, data repositories on getting um, uh, certification from from Quartra Seal that basically means they like um, went through a rigorous review process and that all their documentation is good and that they are like a reliable trusted service um, and that was interesting but it's like not necessarily the 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 most exciting piece to show off because it's not very tangible for for other people um as it's a lot of behind the scenes work um but i still think that's like you know important to do um and it's the part of like open science that probably gets a bit like neglected and uh every once in a while because it's not the the shiny glossy bit um, if you want to hear like more about what Fair's Fair is done, um, we're wrapping up the project and in January, like just after basically your graduation, if you want to listen in, there's a big public event where basically um, we present all the work that has happened in the last um, two years and a bit, well, actually three, I think. Um, um, so more in details. Uh, presentations on the stuff that I just touched on, some other like more technical areas, um, uh, just like give the give the agenda a look uh, and register. It is free, and um, yeah, I would recommend you join us uh, at the end of January. And that's it for me. I hope like I was okay on time. I'm like ready for spicy questions and further comments. I didn't like, didn't want to add like <laughs> too many hot takes into my slides. So um, thank you, thank you, Patricia. That was super. And I, I want to reinforce that this work is super important. All the infrastructure work, so you don't have to keep saying it's not shiny. I think it is shiny, uh, but behind that, behind the scenes, shiny. <laughs> do we do we have time for any questions? I can see there are some in the document. Oh, a bit over. What do you think? I can only see Yo's face. So. Shall we do uh, Lizanne and Alyssa's questions uh, and then maybe yeah. others we can answer in the document? Yeah. Do you want me to read them out, Patricia? We can yeah, like questions. I'm not sure if like how I'm, I could also just okay. stop sharing a slide. So um, Lizanne is saying, uh, in my institute, I have the feeling that most of the training materials about open fair are about the motivation why one should care rather than how practically one could do it. Do you think this uh, partially applies to fair's fair material, or do you think we are getting nearer to the times when it will not be needed anymore? And thanks for your wonderful work, she said as well. Uh, I think we're still like quite a lot is still about the the motivation. That's the thing that like um, I tend to forget. Like after I think I've done like open science work for about 10 years now and you tend to forget that quite a few people just have never thought about this so i think um i think we still have uh will have the the pitches about motivation and why you should care for quite a while just because there are still so many people that we need to um get on board um the fair fair materials are um I think slightly we tried to make it hands on, but um, as I said, like quite a lot of them are actually like aimed at the people that run the services and there's only um, a few of them that are, are actually um, uh, for for the researchers and helping helping them getting um, their stuff done. But like, yeah, I think like if you're if you're getting money for a project that's called fair is fair like you're, you're you're past the step where you need to argue why you're doing this you're actually then trying to focus on um, making it easy to um for, for people to do it and so so um we are focusing on the actual practical how to's um with um but as i said like aimed at quite a lot of people a lot of them working behind the scenes um, and only a few of them that are um, actually usable for for researchers but yeah thanks 
Um, and then the other question from Elisa, um, how would you, how does your work at DMP Online connect to your work for Fairs Fair and the materials you've created there? Um, at the moment, not super obviously, as I said, because like the, the um, places where we see them actually practically connect, uh, we like our uh, use cases in theory and we haven't worked, um, haven't managed to work on the, on the implementation. Um, so the DMP online team is quite small. We don't have that many um, developers. Um, we, we're just hiring more. So um, uh, basically, we didn't have the resource to play around and see what we could do as part of the project. Um, so at the moment, they're like pretty much standalone. In our head, we know that there's a connection. Um, and that we um, should explore that and, um, you know, try and bring those two together. Um, but just because of the lack of time and resources at the moment, they're like separate pieces of work, mm -hmm. unfortunately, which is a bit sad. Um, it's like, yeah, it sounds like it would be really useful, actually, like joining them together. And like that would make yep. people's lives easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is a bit like uh, uh, one of these um, cases where, where you work on two things, you know how they could fit together, but you never manage to actually bring them yeah. together because you need a few other people helping uh, you to do that. Yes. And uh, that's, that's just not their current priority. So yeah, it's a bit of a missed opportunity that we, we basically did this work while the MP online was under-resourced and quite a few of this just needs like someone who can yeah. do some development. And that's unfortunately not me. So, yeah. Bad. Right. Thanks so much, Patricia. That was very wonderful. And um, let's move on to, oh, Patul, you're taking over now. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. So, um, I'm very excited about the second talk by Ivan, which is going to be about citizen science and science communication, which is actually part of my current project right now. So, I'm going to leave it to Ivan to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So my sound is not really good and my English too. So I hope I understand I, the floor is mine and I can <laughs> start introducing myself and, and, and the slides. Thank you. Uh, and it, it was really interesting to, to look at the, the first presentation as, uh, for example, machine actionable data management plan is something really important, I think, for capitalizing on all the work that researchers and future researchers um, uh, yeah, capitalize on the, the work they have done on, on um, ferrization of their data and things like that, uh, providing services, in fact, around the fact that they, they already uh, uh, make a, a great work in terms of addition, uh, creation of metadata or things like that. So thank you for the previous presentation. It was really interesting. So I, I, I try to to show my screen, I, need, I hope it will work. <laughs> yeah, it, it works fine. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I, uh, I will be try. I, I will try to be understandable because of my really approximate from which is not easy. But I will try. Please don't hesitate to ask uh, questions, and maybe I have some issue also to understand your questions. But so don't hesitate to type it uh, on the on the note, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm Yvan Lebras, a scientific and technical coordinator of the, the French uh, Pôle National de Données de Biodiversité, so Biodiversity Infrastructure, uh, who is in fact an infrastructure of, uh, with uh, 17 partners, something like all research institute and university from France who are dealing with biodiversity data and involved in several uh, projects, notably internationally, uh, on Georbon uh, related to the creation of uh, biodiversity indicators or uh, GoFair for implementation network dedicated to biodiversity uh, fair practices. Uh, so I would really try to, 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 to speak a little bit about uh, the link I made between citizen science and open science and why this is really important to have both. Uh, first things in the context is related to, to, to uh, the loss of analytical skills. This is something that I think you can 
see if you are on labs and uh, you really see that more and more people and, and people from life science particularly have difficulties to analyze data because of the amount of data or other things and in fact uh, uh, in this um, in this uh, uh, article from the economist where they are saying that people with the skills to analyze data are scarce and will become scarcer they also say that one of the grand challenges of data intensive science is to facilitate knowledge discovery by assisting human and machines in the discovery of access to integration and analysis of task appropriate scientific data and their associated algorithm and workflow so this is a first point just to say that in fact we need access and to have access the the best thing is to have openness <laughs> and we need also to have discovery and for discovery we need also to have a lot of metadata and this is also part of what uh, uh, was said uh, just before to continue on this context there is an, another important point to is this, this this things we call the data namey who is notably uh, coming in, in life science uh, uh, with uh, next generation sequencing technologies. And here it's a major important point for me uh, because often people are using this kind of, uh, of graph to, to say that we need to have more power, more infrastructures. And in fact, I am saying uh, completely the inverse with this same graph because in fact, what we see here is um, the, 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 the technical possibility of IT to uh, evolve in terms of storage and uh, computing uh, respectively in a uh, green and uh, and uh, pink if i don't say a mistake and in blue is the production of data and in fact what is really amazing when you look at this kind of graph where, where, where you you see that in fact it capacities are, are, are following uh, well-known rules in fact what is really uh, amazing it's to see that there is a rupture there is a, a, a big issue regarding um, uh, the the, the production of data compared to this evolution of it capacities and when we see that clearly the answer is not uh, saying that we need more data center on more cpu on more uh, storage here we need to change the manner we have to deal with data with the manner we analyze the data we share the information and things like that so we need to go more into optimization and mutualization of of uh, existing technology so this thing this is a major point uh, uh, for me so we see that we need op optimize, mutualize, and this is something also related directly to 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 a better openness. And I will, uh, I hope, make the link after that uh, in, in few moments. Another thing is a picture of uh, my desk when I was uh, in uh, in PhD uh, PhD student, uh, and I, I was far from the sea, uh, more than one hundred kilometers, and it's really difficult for me. And uh, I, I have a, a picture. Uh, I, I was with a picture with, uh, of uh, of a dolphin, and also just uh, uh, in front of my of my face, the citation of Albert Einstein, who is saying that most of the fundamental ideas of science are essentially simple and may as the rule be expressed in the language comprehensible to everyone. This is something I think really is a point because we need to, when we are in the science thing, we need to be sure that any everybody, any 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 uh, any kind of people, uh, everybody can have access to to information, to knowledge, so data and other or, or other uh, research objects. So. Clearly here we see that we need to have better exchanges between scientific domains, for example, between ecological uh, uh, science communities, and there is different sub communities who need to, to discuss one with each other and it's quite complicated, we need translators. We need also discussion between uh, this kind of ecological science or life science uh, domains and ICT specialists. And here again, we need a lot of translator <laughs> and uh, this is something we, we, we can see uh, every day. We also need scientific uh, discussion between scientific world and professional users of nature or other professional of, uh, users of what we are uh, studying uh, like uh, in fisheries or agri-food and health and finally between scientific domains and citizens this is something also uh, really uh, crucial uh, to 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 go uh, to go forward so here there is, there is a, a particular point around upscaling for the future and here clearly for me, at least, citizen science is one of the answers combined with open science approach. And I will just uh, try to, to explain why. So, so briefly, there is really a, a context 
quite horrible, particularly in biodiversity, but not also, where we see that data, metadata is, is not available. It's really hard to have access to, to data, to have access to, to papers. And in fact, more generally, there is really a, a, an important challenge to, uh, to, to go through that more uh, openness in terms of uh, sharing research objects, protocols, data, paper, source codes, uh, everything needs to be, to be shared uh, broadly. Just to, to present a particular uh, uh, reason in, uh, in biodiversity world, this is one of the major uh, issues we faced with uh, biodiversity crisis. Uh, we see that uh, countries are defining uh, archi biodiversity targets uh, to, to try to, to, to go forward in a good direction and things like that, or a little bit like for climate. And next year, uh, last year, sorry, uh, we see that uh, uh, no one of these targets were, uh, were fully met. And, and it's really something really bad for, for the world, for people, for, for, the, for health and, and things like that. So we, we need really to, to follow biodiversity dynamics and produce metrics to monitor its state and, and guide decision making. But to do so, we need data. The data is the first layer. And, and if you look at the data, you can really make the, the job trying to have access to, to, to data. And you can see that, for example, you can have something like a, a quarter of the data who normally is accessible is not reachable for different kind of uh, reason, because there is no licenses, or you need to ask something, someone, or, or, think, or the access, uh, or you see things, but there is no data. This is just a picture or thing like that. Uh, PDF sometimes, uh, yeah, the, the, the famous error uh, for all four or so often. And, and, and also the fact that you are often in biodiversity, particularly um, face to, to derive data. This is no raw data. This is something who is not a raw material who can be used to, to have precise information, so precise knowledge about the state of the biodiversity and things like that. Uh, another thing that is important always in the, in the scope of biodiversity is that we, we are facing the, the six max six extension. We can say uh, a lot of things around that, but this is the fact. And what is really uh, a, a point, an interesting point on this particular mass extension is, is, is it's due to, to one species, notably us. And, and this is something important. I hope you will find why, uh, because I will just speak a little bit after after on that. But if you want to look, it, this is the president of the National Museum of Natural History who make a, a brief presentation of the six max extension and really all the important things are on this, this presentation. So I hope there is a, at least automatic translation of the, the, the discourse, but it's really amazing. Uh, so another thing, uh, if you look at openness, you say, OK, uh, we can open. We can create open source tool. We can open the data and things like that. But one interesting thing is if data sharing is the answer, what is the question? Because often we are open because we want to be friend and open and things like that because it's cool to be open. But in fact, there is a, uh, always a question and a reason why you have to be open. And I think it's important. To, to, to ask the question and find your, your, your personal reason or the, the reason for your domains. Particularly in ecology, for example, there is all the, the, the aspect related to, to fight against climate or, or, or the skepticism, uh, the fake news and things like that. It's something today is really uh, uh, very present. Uh, all the aspect around trust and transparency around the creation, for example, of biodiversity indicators and so action from policy to, to and who uh, act on, on, uh, on uh, the everyday life of people and for sure the aspect or the acceleration of discovery uh, production of knowledge thus protection uh, protection conservation of, of biodiversity because we better protect what we know this is something quite logical in biodiversity but it's important so if we want to better protect we want to better know we want better in, in uh, biodiversity in, in the, um, indicators, sorry, because it's, it's like this, that policy can make their job. So we need scientific data and tools, and we need access to these tools, to this data. So we need an, a certain degree of openness and things like that. And this is my last uh, things, my last slide, where I I, tr I will try to, to, to combine all this idea and, and really show how all these the things are combining the, the, the importance of open science, citizen science. We need to have science understandable by citizen. 
So to do so, we can go to Rad's Open Science because this is the primary step. If we want to open something to people, we need to open the things. We, we need to give access to the things. This is, we, we can't make a, a, by another way. So we need to, 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 to go to Open Science and going to our Open Science, we see also that we can uh, then involve citizens because they have access to research objects. They can also have access to the, the scientific projects, in fact, and the science itself. And what is interesting if, if you are using citizen science, this is maybe the solution, in fact, to deal with data naming. And here I, I just uh, proposed in a, in a previous European project called GASP GAPARS, uh, a concept which is called Massively Open Online Data Analysis, MUDA, something quite horrible as a name, but uh, we're just investigating two manner to involve people in the analysis steps. And in fact, all the idea is, is really quite simple. For now, uh, often we are using citizens just as free ends. And in fact, the more important thing is to involve citizens to search to uh, enhance their knowledge of the scientific questions and so the scientific domains and, and use it, but in collaboration uh, uh, in, the, in the project, in fact. So there is two particular levels, one around crowdsourcing and another around uh, really data analysis. And I will just uh, uh, take two minutes to, to present you some of, the, of, of this. For example, for crowdsourcing, a classical manner to, to, to do is to use citizens as free ends. So we are asking citizens to annotate data, classifying things with, in, in a smartphone or a web interface or something like that. And the idea is at the end to have an AI uh, classifier who can be used by maybe the, the, the same uh, citizens or others from a smartphone or something like that to recognize a, a plant or something like that. Here you see that in fact, the citizen is not involved in the project. Ah, you can describe something around the project and think that there is not real involvement in the project and there is no, uh, uh, no engagement, in fact, yeah, that's it. We can see that in another manner with the same, uh, uh, outcomes, but not with the same vision. We can say that, in fact, the goal is to really put the citizen as the main actors. And you can imagine that your idea is more to, to, to enhance the knowledge of the uh, people who are participating to the project. Making it, you also have data annotation. You also create an AI classifier, but this is not a, the goal you want for this project. Because once you have one AI classifier for plants, for example, for a project, you can just say to citizens, okay, now you involve your, your, your knowledge, uh, you enhance your knowledge, and you can uh, switch to another scientific project and have new knowledge on other projects. And this is our goal. So the high, high classifier is just something we can capitalize on that, but it, it's not our, our goal, in fact. And this is something where you can think about uh, an AI agent who can help the citizen uh, enhancing its knowledge, uh, the knowledge of the people, for example, during the project. So you use the same kind of technology and actors, but really not in the same way. And you will really have a, a greater impact, uh, notably in terms of, um, of uh, knowledge enhancement. Uh, briefly, on, on other uh, things related to, to having data, we see that, for example, in biodiversity, there is something like a fight. There is, in one way, a lot of citizen science projects. And in another way, you have remote sensing. So quite briefly, saying, comparing the, the both is, is quite complicated because remote sensing is quite uh, perfect in certain way because it's, it can give a, a, a picture of the global uh, earth uh, rapidly and with data with uh, something quite standardized originally and quite easy to, to use and analyze. And with citizen science data, the problem is you, you have data really heterogeneous and you have to work on the metadata things and structuration, who is something quite hard to do, but you have something who is interesting uh, uh, in relation with the quality of the data. And clearly for now, we more invest in, in something like uh, technology and remote sensing and not in citizen science or really involvement of citizen science. But having citizen science, citizen observatories around the world for, for health, for uh, ecology or things like that is for me really the good key to have more data, quality data, precious data, who can really give a good knowledge about the state of the earth or, or something like that. So it's, it's something where you, we need to think, I think. 
And finally, this kind of idea around uh, analytical power, scientists don't have time or don't have enough analytical power or people to analyze the data. For sure, we can choose the fact that we need to have more storage, more CPU, more AI or things like that. But the best way, for example, is to involve citizens and people who can, once again, uh, enhance their knowledge and take part of the data thanks to tools which they can use and where they can analyze the data and use it and better understand what is uh, the, the question of the scientific uh, domains or things like that. So briefly, engagement and elevation of, of knowledge of citizens can be really a focus of our research project and, and be rich thanks to open science notably. And just to, to, to close the loop, this is really the, the, the way where we also can be in the action because if we need action of citizens, we need citizens to have information. And in fact, science is in between and it's it's clear that the, the, the loop is there and we need to have engagement, elevation, uh, knowledge of citizens so they can act on the everyday life to uh, facilitate uh, and to ameliorate the world where we are in terms of climate, uh, biodiversity or, or things like that. So thank you very much. I hope I was not too confusing and too or too long and uh, just uh, so see uh, there my, my uh, my team uh, colleagues with uh, uh, whom I work on on this such interesting uh, ideas, for example. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Ivan, for the amazing talk. I mean, I like how you try to make the citizen the main actor, not just like by involving them in the analysis, not just as freehand. This is something we've been thinking a lot about in my own project, where we ask citizens to collect samples for soil but we want them to interact more within the project, like analyzing data or some kind of interaction within the data itself. So thank you so much. Uh, if anyone got a question, they can unmute themselves as well. Uh, we have one question within, oh, we have a couple of questions within the Google, uh, within the Etherpad. Emmy is asking, is citizen science possible or advisable for all research fields? Well, she said she's often heard from searcher from basic science field that they find it hard to think about how citizens can be involved in their work. Um, yeah, really, really good question, uh, Amy. It's, I think a, a brief answer can be yes, of course. <laughs> and uh, one of the, 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 the ideas is, for example, there is some project like the Gap Arts European project where I'd be part of, of uh, they, they made a, a, a lot of interesting development, IT development, to, to reach citizens in any kind of questions, in fact. The problem is when you are on this kind of framework you developed, you often are on solution who are not involving really people on the, on the project. So I think you have to, to think about IT solution, maybe innovative one in each uh, domains, who can really uh, uh, give the opportunity to involve citizens and in the meantime, be sure that they are really involved in the scientific project and the research question. Oh, thank you, Ivan. I, I don't think thinking, for example, gamification. Gamification is a way to, to open any kind of research topics in, in, in citizens broadly, for example. I see. Uh, we've got one more question. I'm not sure of the time. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's something I'm curious about as well. So do you think you need a way to reward the citizen financially for their labor? Uh, or just their own motivation is enough? Um, for me, deeply, the motivation, the motivation is enough. And it will be the own, in fact, a, a project where we, you will give awards, for example, in gamification, uh, is something not good because people, if you want to have real engagement, the real engagement you, you can have from citizens if, if they really want, if they share the project, if they really want to, to achieve the, the solution you start to, to, to achieve, in fact. So, so clearly the best is to have a just motivation around that. And, and the, the other part is also just briefly because a, a major uh, caveat we have with citizen science project or, or crowdsourcing uh, activities, exact, in fact, you, you, you are working on rewarding or communication and things like that. And in fact, you see that you have only a, a, a few uh, percentage of the big amount of participants who are really contributing to the things 
end, you see also with the time that in fact you have a decrease of the participation. And this is clearly due to this, to this fact of, of not just choosing motivation, but rewarding our communication. So this is just functioning like this. And I, in my opinion, this is clearly not uh, scalable, in fact, this, this kind of manner to do. Thank you again for the wonderful talk, Susan. So I'm, I'm going to move to the second talk, which is going to be about software citation by Stefan. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. I'm just going to quickly share my slides, which you should be able to see right now. Let me know if you can't. Yeah. Great. So yes, uh, thanks for the invitation to talk for me to talk about software citation with a citation format uh, today. A um, few words about myself. I'm Stefan Duskat. I'm a doctoral researcher at the German Aerospace Center here in Berlin. Um, my topic is actually software citation, so this is right at the core of what I do. Um, I'm also a Software Sustainability Institute special collaborator, and um, together with Julian Spax from the Netherlands eCenter, currently the co-lead of the citation file format project. And I am going to talk a little bit about what software citation is, why it is hard or harder than some other things, and where the citation file format can actually actually help you get your get your uh, software cited. So, um, we basically, I think it's safe to say that most of us or all of us will have learned how to do this, namely citing a paper in your research. Um, and we've done so for, for almost centuries now. And it's fairly easy to, to cite papers because all of the rele relevant information is actually um, on, printed onto the first page um, or on the website for the, for the journal paper. Um, also, it's really easy to do because there's a lot of tooling around, um, such as reference managers, et cetera. Um, and the, this tooling helps us kind of get the, get the right info for citation automatically. And we can then use this information in our own work, for example, when we write paper, like we can, you know, copy, copy and paste citations into the references list of our paper. Now, when we think about software citation, there are some uh, principles and peculiarities um, which kind of set apart what, what, how, the way that software citation can work or should work from the way we cite papers. And there are three points that I'd like to stress here. Um, and all these, all these things are from a paper called The Software Citation Principles from 2016 um, that was published by a FORCE 11 working group by the name of the Software Citation Working Group. And it basically outlines the, the principles behind software citation. And the three points that I would like to stress here are, um, there is a question around importance, sorry for that, um, namely, um, it is not yet established practice that people cite software as they would cite a paper. And this is really where we need to go because if we want uh, software to be cited, um, it needs to be cited properly. So a link to a GitHub repository in a paper or even just mentioning the name of a software isn't enough. Um, and we want to do this because Software is a, is a valid research output in the first place, but also it's really relevant for things like reproducibility of research results, um, which you can't do if you don't know about the whole you know, provenance of a research result. So software is definitely these days anyway, a big part of, of how people get their results. So importance is a very, very important principle for software citation. Um, and so is accessibility because citation should also enable access to the software and to the metadata itself. Um, and that's just because, again, uh, this is important for reproducibility. If people want to kind of work and understand your results, work with the results, uh, reproduce them, take them somewhere else, kind of take the software and reuse it in a different environment, they have to be able to use a citation to the software to get to the software itself. And finally, there is a difference between papers and software uh, in terms of specificity, because you know, usually there is one final version of a paper that's published in a journal. Sometimes there is a preprint. Sometimes there are more than one, but even you know, still a, a small number of versions of a paper. For example, on on open access journals such as F1000, where you have kind of the the first version and then you have a a reviewed version and a and, a, and an optimized version as the second version. 
but software has usually has many, many versions. And that doesn't just include the released versions, like version 1.0, version 1.1, et cetera, but also in theory, at least, all the, all the commits that people make when they develop the software and they commit that to the version control system. So if you want to make sure that people know about the version you have used in your research, you have to make sure that you uh, cite the version that was actually used. Um, now, all of this pertains to software metadata or the, the, the research um, output metadata. And the, the issue with software as compared to papers, for example, is that you don't have a prompt page, meaning that sometimes you can't be sure what uh, the metadata, the correct metadata to cite would be. And that, this includes things like the name of the software. Um, it's probably not um, PhD script v2.py, maybe something else. Um, you usually cannot tell who the authors of a software would be. So the, the list of people that would qualify as authors. Um, it may be all of the people that have contributed um, pushing to a GitHub repository, but there may be more people. And some of the people who have maybe fixed the typo in the, in the version control system would not qualify as authors. Um, you're not sure about the journal, the publisher, and the publishing date you may get from, again, from a version control system, but is that really something that's reliable? Um, so this is where the citation file format comes in. And what it does is it helps you to provide all the relevant metadata um, to people that use your software. So they will be enabled to cite your software correctly with a complete and correct set of metadata. Um, technically, the citation file format is um, a, a format specification. Um, it, the implementation of the self citation file format is um, the, a, a, a plain text file formatted in a thing called YAML, um, which is basically key value pairs where you can have lists as values, etc. So it looks it looks like this. This is a very simple example here on the right hand side of my slide, um, and you can see that there are you know the the stuff you would expect from such a file, such as the title of the software, um, a list of authors, a version number and that refers to the specificity, specificity principle I've talked about before, the release date and some identifiers and extra information such as where I can, where can, where I can get the code and, and the license. Um, the citation file format also caters to some needs um, of, of users that are not really comfortable yet with having their software cited directly. And there is kind of a, um, a circumvent way around this where you can actually put a preferred citation to a paper, for example, into the CFF file, and then people will um, read the file and know that this is what you want them to cite. Um, because some, you know, the community out there, some, some domains especially, are not ready yet to accept that what you actually want to cite is the software itself. So they, they're, they're more happy to, um, to cite a paper. And also, um, the citation file format goes beyond the actual software citation principles in that you can actually have a list of references for your software, uh, such as you would have in a paper. And this is really important because a lot of research software is not user-facing, meaning that there are libraries that you reuse in software, um, but that people would usually not um, use directly. And as a matter of fact, these dependencies of the software, these, these uh, packages that you use in your own software also, you know, the, the authors also does deserve credit. So a, re a references list in a citation CFF file makes that possible. And you can imagine that if all of the research pro uh, software projects did this, you can actually build a whole uh, citation graph from this and everybody would get the credit they deserve. Um, yes. So. Um, as you may have guessed, the focus of the citation file format is clearly on citation metadata. There are some other more general metadata formats for software out there, such as code meta. And also the project focuses on, on usability. We want to make it easy for people to read and write these files and also give them some tooling to, to work with them. Um, to some extent, CFF is also going to um, self-documenting because it has a field in the file format that actually says uh, it's, it's, it's a message field and it says if you use the software please cite it using these metadata so that people when, when people discover one of these files in the wild they they know what they're looking at 
Um, and there are some new, some new integrations um, for the citation file format with some well-known platforms, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. But first up, um, I'd like to take, take a step back and talk a bit about why we call the citation file format a community format. Um, and it's mainly because it really is, because it's, you know, the, the concept for this format has been developed um, in a discussion group in 2017 at a workshop um, around resource software. And we've gone on to um, run community consultations and collab collaboration events around the, around the, the format um, almost every year for the, for the last four years. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that to really get people's input and and uh, have them contribute to the to the project. Um, I'm almost tempted to say, of course, we developed the format openly on GitHub, and there is actually a GitHub organization for the format specs, etc. But also for the tooling. So they most most of the sub projects live there. Most of the tooling lives in this GitHub organization, and we also have some tooling that's developed um, outside of the main project. For example, uh, recently. There has been a package called an R package called CFFR been added to R OpenSci, which um, basically interlinks the um, R metadata and the citation file format. So that's that's great. Um, we provide templates for people um, to work with, and everything that is in the citation file format project is um, licensed openly through you know some some of the stuff is because it's documentation or specifications it's licensed under a um, um, CC or CC by license but we also use open open source licenses um, we have community documentation such as a code of conduct and I know it's not really um, optimal yet because we still have to establish a way to um, work with code of conduct reports etc um, we also have contribution guidelines um, um, and you know all the all the things you would expect uh, to be um, in an open in an open project. Um, we do also collaborate with other related projects, mostly uh, through the Force Eleven Software Citation Implementation Working Group, um, and this would be projects like Code Meta, for example, um, who are kind of working in the same in the same space. And quite recently, we've had an addition to the Turing Way um, community documentation for open science um, and that focuses on the format explains what the format is but also lets you know how to actually create such a file and i've uh, briefly touched on this we are in the process of developing a more formal governance model and we do so in, uh, as part of the uh, first cohort of the code for science and society digital infrastructure incubator so, so that's that's really good it gives it gives us an opportunity to actually react to some of the some of the recent developments and put the, the whole CFF project on more stable feet in terms of governance. Um, now going back to the, the practical practical aspects of, of uh, CFF, um, I think you may remember this table from a recent presentation by Nicoletta um, in a previous call, um, where she used this table from, from Lucy Wally, who's presented it in September RC. And I would actually like to add some things to, to that because um, the way that Nicoletta used this table is kind of coming from the software publication perspective where it is actually perfectly correct. Um, but if you switch pers perspectives and take the software citation perspective, there are some bits missing, uh, especially with, with respect to, to CFF. Um, because if you, if you put a CFF file into your repository, obviously that doesn't give you a... Um, a journal publication, but that's actually not what the CFF is for. CFF is more like a messenger format that will let you uh, let, let people know about an existing software citation um, possibility. So you can uh, put a DOI for uh, a software paper or software meta paper into the CFF file. Um, so that's why I put these question marks here. So it's actually, you, you can reuse kind of the CFF format for um, publicizing your software paper or software meta paper. And there is an aspect um, with regard to the software citation principles that I've touched on earlier in that what the citation file format gives you over all these other options is that you actually follow the software citation principles because the CFF file um, includes the metadata to the software itself and not some uh, kind of related product or output. Um, and I think this is really important because 
if you use CFF, it gives you actually a way to adhere to these principles to make sure that you regard the software as the important output, to make sure that it's accessible by putting in metadata um, that lets people find and reuse um, the software. And also just by having a version field, you can be very specific about what, your, what version of the software you, you're looking at. And like I said, it also gives you um, more visibility for things like the paper about the software. In practice, um, it's now since very recently fairly easy to create um, a citation.cff file. Uh, thankfully, the colleagues at the Netherlands East Science Center have um, created a um, fairly easy to use website called CFF init. It's basically a, a, a form that you know gives you some clues about to what, what what to put in to your CFF file. You can, you can click through the pages and uh, create your citation CFF file that way. And then at the end, you just download it and add it to your repository. Make sure obviously to keep it updated as well. Um, and just this July, um, GitHub has announced um, that they want to implement a citation software citation feature. And they've done so based on this uh, citation file format, which was great news, obviously, because it uh, gave the, the project more visibility and let people know that this is something that they can actually do uh, fairly easily. Um, so what, the way this works is that when you, when you put a citation.cff file in your repository and you push it to GitHub, GitHub will then render this widget you can see on the left here um, that lets people know um, how they can cite the software they're looking at um, in either a preformatted string or just convert by copying and pasting the, the bib, te bib text snippet. Um, there is some documentation available for this as well on GitHub and the widget itself links to the CFF file so that if people want to find out more about um, things that aren't included in the citation string, such as a license, they can go there and, and read through the file. And why this is interesting and important is because uh, GitHub haven't been the only ones to um, support this citation file format. Um, just a couple of minutes after GitHub announced support, Zenodo came forward and said, well, see how we you have this way of automatically kind of harvesting um, software releases from GitHub and put them in Zenodo so people get a DOI for this. Um, the issue used to be that when you did this, you would ha still have to go to the Zenodo website and kind of go through the metadata, make sure that the name of the software was correct and not just the name of the repository, make sure that all the authors um, were mentioned in the metadata. This now works automatically because Zenodo will now take the information in the CFF file and use that as their metadata for, for the Zenodo record. Um, so that's that's really great. It's really useful uh, um, for, for people that develop and release um, software, especially if they do it often. And then finally, to kind of complete this the, the workflow, people that use the Zotero reference manager can now simply go to a, a GitHub repository, click on the browser button that Zotero provides, and the correct metadata from the CFF file will go into the record in the Zotero reference management software. So in a way, everything from kind of development, creating the CFF file, public, publishing the software properly with a DOI on Zenodo, um, and then people reusing this citation to use in their papers, for example, is now a complete workflow that's kind of supported by CFF and covered by um, the respective platforms. So just as a way of a quick quick uh, summary and outlook, um, the GitHub integration especially uh, was um, like, you know, I like to say like an inverted moon landing for us and that it's been a giant leap for the citation file format. It's, it's still a small step for software citation because there are still some really hard to uh, tackle issues around software citation. For example, how, do you, how can you make sure that the CFF file is um, up to date at all times? Um, things like this, but you know we're working on some of these issues, and I think it's very, very good that uh, software citation as a process and as a principle now has a more visible kind of outlet. And there are more integrations coming as well, so um, we're working on actually including something similar to GitHub in the GitLab platform, which is used widely in institutions, um, and also Jabrev as another uh, another reference manager have have already implemented support. And like I said, a very important step forward, and this is kind of the, the step we're working on right now, is to develop a proper govern governance as part of the um, digital infrastructure incubator because there are still some shortcomings such as 
uh, the not really actionable code of conduct at the moment. And we want to make sure that, if, especially when people leave the project, um, that there is a structure that will help uh, take the project forward and um, yeah, make it sustainable, I guess. And with this, I think I'm finished and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks for listening. Don't see Batul anymore. Maybe her internet dropped, but I'm gonna take over and um, ask you all uh, if you have any questions for Stefan's wonderful talk. Um, please leave them on the Etherpad line 158 at the moment. Um, Aaron has a question, and I think Stefan, you might have partially answered that, but maybe you can expand on this as well. Um, is the handling of CFF with reference managers different from regular references? So he usually cites software by mentioning the website or repository, but it would be great to have, uh, it would be, sorry, it would be way more useful to save it um, in EndNote or Bib text file. Right, so in a way, um, handling the citation file format is different because, because of the way that reference managers handle software records. As you may know, um, there is no um, structurally uh, good way to handle software in BibTeX, for example, just because the software type in BibTeX is an alias for the miscellaneous type. So everything that's not uh, something that's traditionally um, accepted as a, as a good research output is just handled as something that we don't know anything about. Um, so in this way, it's still kind of hacky to get uh, the information from a reference manager into your paper, for example. Um, if you want to make sure that the version is somewhere in there, you have to change the title string, for example, and include the version there, things like this. Um, you usually cite software by mentioning the website or repository. Well, the, the software citation principles say something about citing software and what you should link to as well. And the ideal um, scenario is that the developers will publish their software so that the version gets a DOI or another um, unique identifier. And that's what people should cite for the version, especially, especially because if that ID is resolved, then it'll take them straight to the version of the software that people have used. Um, the whole software publication process in itself is still uh, very much work in progress because although you can have uh, a DOI for cheap on Zenodo, for example, you still lack the kind of peer review step before that. So that's where things like you know, great projects like JOS come in and because they provide review. Um, and also, although it gives you a snapshot of the software, you, you know, there are still some and uh, there's still some some things to 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 take care of, such as making sure that every single version that you publish has the correct metadata, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, ideally, the way you want to go though in in citing a software is make sure that the so you cite the software in the same way you would cite a paper. Have a link to have a citation to the reference and include the reference in the references list, and make sure that you yourself are as precise as possible. Um, with regard to the version you've used, et cetera. So I guess that's, yeah, there, there is still a, a large culture change that needs to come our way and um, we, we need to work on um, so that people um, are mindful of how they, how far they cite software and data for that matter as well, to make sure that the kind of the citation graph is correct and complete. Thank you. Um, and going, down the list, uh, Patricia asks, uh, now that you solved the technical part, are there any plans to change the culture? For example, conversations with publishers to encourage software citation and check for this as part of the editorial process. Yeah. Uh, can we please have uh, quotations around the solve the technical part? <laughs> I think we've come quite a way, but it's, I don't think it's you know, solved or even solvable, maybe. We'll see. But yes. Um, Definitely, there are plans to change the culture, and it's 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 an ongoing process. For example, coming from the Force Eleven Software Citation Implementation Working Group, we did practice needed to practice this for a bit. Um, 
So there has been work and a recently published paper by Dan Katz et al. that makes the whole software citation issue very visible to publishers. And there are pu many publishers also in the FOSS 11 working group. So this is definitely um, work in progress. Um, I know that there are there is a project um, currently working on the metadata schema that a lot of publishers use um, to include or make possible make it possible to 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 include software um, in that so it's definitely but still <clears throat> i mean the ideally every single researcher who publishes something and uses software for their work will have to be aware of how to cite software and will have to actually make you know, make the effort to to do it um, culture change i think will be ongoing for for a long time if not forever um, because every every new generation of research, researchers have to has to kind of break with the tradition of the journal article is the the be all and end all of research um, and be aware that there, there are other things like software um, that are valid outputs. So yeah, I mean definitely culture culture change is a big part of this. Fantastic, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I would say we do a short uh, reflection and, and Stefan, if you don't mind, um, there are two more questions on the other, other path. Um, if you can um, answer that maybe directly on the path, that would be really helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Yo uh, for the reflection exercise. Thank you so much, Amy, and uh, thank you everyone who's already been doing some really incredible talks. Um, so we're just going to wrap up with a little bit of a uh, reflection. Um, so we've talked about uh, different ways that you can disseminate or credit other people's research outputs. So for Stefan, we're very much talking about either disseminating your software or giving people credit for software you've used. Uh, we've talked about getting people involved um, through citizen science and in fact helping um, getting citizens to be uh, leading. Uh, ideally, and importing into science. And then we've talked earlier on about uh, managing data as an important output of your research. Um, so the reflection exercise today, right at the bottom of the etherpad, looking at line 172, uh, prompt is, if you could make one element of research dissemination easier or different, so it doesn't have to be easier, maybe you think something needs to be harder for some reason, uh, let us know. Um, so just have a think, pop it down line 174, what the change would be, why, and if you want, you can also add how that maybe applies to your project. Um, speakers and hosts, very welcome to reflect on this one as well. I will go um, mute for a minute or two and then we'll come back and just look at what answers we've had.
Okay, some some things are uh, still coming in. Keep keep that typing going. Uh, I now challenge you to type and listen at the same time, uh, but only because there's only three minutes left on the call. Um, so some really nice answers here. Um, Ovika talks about sharing the processes and workflows. Um, document how you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I, I will agree with this. Uh, documents are hard. Documentation is hard. No one likes it. Uh, I don't know any good way to change this, but the easier we make it and the more commonplace we make it, the better it will get. Um, we have um, Arendt's mentioning image data sharing um, and metadata around that as well. We have a nice comment from Sebastian about communicating work with general audience and not just the research community. Um, I think this, this strikes some beautiful notes with Yuval's talk as well. Um, I just sort of mentioned for myself, I'd like to see less of a race to publish and more of a, how do we collaborate uh, together when we're doing this. Um, it's more of a dissemination method, less fast, more together, something like that. Although fast is great too, uh, just not first. <laughs> Patricia mentions changing the system and moving away from a publication centered workflow and metrics that don't mean anything. I, I think we could spend an hour digging into that really comfortably. Um, I can see some support here on the videos. Uh, I think we agree with this one. Um, Alyssa mentions recognizing and rewarding different roles than just authorship of general, journal articles. Yes, here, here. Um, and Emmy mentions being aware that the people we are involved in the process and how that affects the work that we produce together. Um, so I, I, I feel like we are, we are coalescing on wishing that some of the other things other than papers are important, even though papers are great. I'm working on a paper right now. I love it. Or maybe I'm, I'm exhausted and I, I just need it done, but it's all good. Um, right, we have two minutes. Um, if you have more thoughts, keep them coming in. I can see typing still happening in the doc. Thank you, folks. Um, but we are going to do one of the magical things we never do. Um, and we are going to close on time. Emmy, go for it. Pressure. Okay, next week is holiday. <laughs> uh, we're going to be on the break um, between the Saturday and January 5th inclusive. So apologies for any delays in emails in advance. But when we're back, uh, week 15th, which I believe begins on the 10th of January, we'll have rehearsals for graduation. So if you haven't already, please sign up for one of the one hour rehearsal sessions that we have. Um, you'll have a chance to present a bit of your presentation for the graduation and get a bit of feedback. Um, and learn about how to give feedback. Yep, I think that's the case. And then very exciting, uh, week 16 is graduation week. So again, if you haven't already, there's the Eventbrite link on 9192. Sign up for a graduation slot that works for you. Um, invite your friends and colleagues to celebrate this occasion with you by inviting them to join the graduation call. Uh, you can ask them to sign up by the Eventbrite as well. I think there's two types of tickets. Ones, for, ones are for you as a presenter and the others are for what, I don't know what, I don't remember what it's called, viewers. Um, but, well, the other type. So <laughs> I hope it's, it's self-explanatory. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you to our wonderful speakers, uh, Patricia, Ivan and Stefan for your amazing informative talks. Uh, we, we love having you and we love having all of you here. Have a wonderful break. Um, if you're having one, have a wonderful start of the new year. All, uh, all of us are having a start of the new year, I suppose. So <laughs> um, enjoy and uh, yeah, see you in the new year. Thanks, for See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care.